So welcome, Michael, to our conversation. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to my network and my friends out there. And uh, please uh, tell us who you are, where you are, and what you've done in your whole biography in three minutes. <laughs> I'm an American, uh, for better or for worse. I live on the West Coast. Um, was um, pretty much uh, started off in California and now live up uh, by Canada in a state called Washington mm -hmm. and was in education as a teacher for 18 years and became an educational consultant, which I still am. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're uh, known for your, your methods that I mean, I've, for the people watching out here, we've how long have we known each other? It's been about oh. 30, 30, 40 years. <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I think it was in the 1980s I, I uh, took the contact and you've been to Sweden many times. Um, but your work is about, uh, um, well, you can explain it better than I can, but micro aspects of, of uh, behavior, uh, nonverbal uh, communication yeah. and leadership. And that's why I took contact because I'm interested in know yeah. what good teachers do well. How would you describe what you do? Well, the, the family joke is when you have an older brother that has a PhD in linguistics, you, you go to nonverbals. So <laughs> I'm, I'm a nonverbal expert, even though I'm trained in neurolinguistic programming mm -hmm. and had the privilege of being professionally raised to some extent by Carl Rogers. Mm -hmm. So I have a, a nice balance between those two. And I was very interested in uh, as a teacher, why certain days I was better than others. And I, I certainly know when I taught high school and every 45 minutes, I had a different set of students that came through. Some of them thought I walked on water and others thought I should be under it. And I never thought I was as good as those that thought I was good. And I was never as bad as those that thought uh, I should have selected a different career. So in looking at what is success, that was a driving question for me. I came up with nonverbals more than non than verbals. And your voice tone is part of the nonverbal. So only what you would type out, that's the only part that is the, the verbal. So hmm. how you express it, how you read it, those are all nonverbals. And different researchers would indicate probably 80 to 90% of your message is your nonverbals. So I was very, very intrigued with what makes the difference when I'm on and when I'm off. And part of my conclusion is it's not up to me. <laughs> I can do everything I want to, but sometimes I just don't have the um, enough permission from students, from faculty, from the community, from my principal to do even better than I was doing. But I've been so it started out with a lot of self-analysis, actually. Yeah. Uh, then you had some type of theoretical framework uh, for this work. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. And then, uh, but th this word permission is something that you use often. Yeah. yeah. Can you explain, explain what you mean by that? Well, if you want, uh, for those people in your network that are interested, if they go to YouTube and type in my name and then add house of communication, because there's mm -hmm. several houses. And basically, it says that there are four floors on your professional development level. Mm. The first floor is your content, and that's the verbal. Mm. The second floor is how do you deliver that, which is nonverbal. And that's my, where I center around. Those two levels are what I call the science of communication. Mm. Then the next two levels are what's called the art. Mm. The art is perception. Your timing, what do you think is going on? So this is how to respond. This is what you see. And then the last level is permission. Each of these levels supersedes the one before. So if you don't have permission, you're dead, no matter how good you are in the other three. So it really helps you go, okay, I used to think success was, did I get my outcomes? And I know I still get paid and I'm viewed by other people as, did you get the outcomes? But there's a self-evaluation that I recommend people have, and that is, how did I do based on the level of permission I had? And so that's a new definition of what is success. How did I do based on the level of permission I had? 
and the days when I just really, in the eyes of my own evaluation, bombed, but I kept trying this, I tried that, I tried that, I tried that. Those were my best days. Those are the flexible days. Those are the days where you have to say, set aside how you feel. Come on, what's going on? Try something else. And so to me, permission is the ultimate. Well, one of the struggles I have in my work here is to get teachers to look inside themselves and you know, do the self-analysis. Because it's always, you know, it's the, the kid's fault or the parent's fault or the politician's fault and everybody else is doing everything wrong. I'm just, you know, yeah. delivering. So this is the goal of the lesson. And, and if you're not interested in, in learning, I can't do much about it. Yeah. And that's so self-defeative. And uh, oh, I wish I was even better at that. It's a, you know, look at yourself first before you look at other people and, or, or the kids. So you know, it's, it's, a, it's an extremely important message you have. Yeah, it, it sure seems, John, like, mm -hmm. you know, you can have someone watch themselves on tape mm -hmm. uh, and go into another classroom. Right. And by the way, I felt like that was my biggest breakthrough, John. Mm -hmm. I did not solve the question when I was successful, why was I? Mm -hmm. So I started looking at other classrooms. Oh. Yes, I, then it wasn't me that I was watching, it was someone right. else. So one of the things we do is yep. when we, so one of the things we find is if you, instead of filming yourself straight on, because then when you watch it, you're watching, you're doing eyeball with yourself, right? film yourself at a 45 degree angle, because then you're seeing not wow. eyeball to eyeball, it's easier for you to go, this is what's going on. Okay. Well, that, that's interesting. I never thought of that. So uh, I'm always learning something from you. Well, that's for sure. That was a good idea. <laughs> I remember an incident, uh, one, one of your visits to, uh, I was a principal of a school and we went around to different classrooms and one was at another school, it was at a junior high school and we came into the room and you'll probably remember this and you whispered in my ear what you were seeing and you, you, you know, identify the, the boys in the corner that are the potential uh, disruptors and uh, the, the teacher got a question from the other side, a girl from the other side of the room asked a question and you whispered in my ear, if the teacher takes one, you know, a couple steps to the left, then those boys are gonna start to talk. And if she, she answers the question by going towards the boys, then they won't start to talk. And lo and behold, that's exactly what happened. She went towards the girl, which is natural impulse, instead of towards the boys with her body. And uh, the boys started. Uh, started yeah. up, yeah, and uh, it, it's a perfect example, of, of, I think, of, of your approach and you know how these small things that you really don't think about <clears throat> have such a large impact. Yeah, I keep a little. Um, <clears throat> most people would call it a shooting star uh, mm -hmm. in my travel bag because it helps me remember. It's the little things that really light up uh, your insight in terms of what's going on. It's a shame that we don't have for people a checklist so that they can do a self-analysis because mm -hmm. without that list and you're just trying to reflect, I think you get lost in your own belief systems. Whereas mm -hmm. if you have something that's on paper and you really are trying to check it off, you right. have a better chance of coming up with an insight. Okay. But if you, uh, if we talk about permission, and that seems to be a, uh, if you think of a, of a group that you, yeah. was most difficult for you. What are, what are the, one of the groups that you had a really difficult time getting permission from? And what did I, you do? I, it's not limited to one group, I tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the two groups that come to mind in particular, actually three, uh, one was police, one was military, and one for some reason was a speech pathologist. The police mm -hmm. one is the best one for me in terms of learning because uh, I came into an area, it was a base where they're training the new recruits for the highest level, for the state level called mm -hmm. state police. And probably had 80 of them. And as I walked in the room, they all stood up. I had to tell them to sit down. They would not sit down until I told them to. So I had all, <laughs> I had all power permission, right? but I didn't have any intellectual permission. And so I, tried everything I could. In fact, I brought three officers up because I was trying to explain 
that your profession is going to allow you and teach you to disassociate. And if even if you start to reach for your gun, you go through a train process where you are no longer yourself. You have no feelings because you have to do your job. And this is true for first responders in general. But the divorce rate is over 70%. So when you go home, if you don't know how to switch back from being disassociated to associated, you have divorce. So mm -hmm. I had three officers that came up and told their stories. Two of them had been divorced before, the third one still <clears throat> in first marriage. And I thought, well, I'm doing everything I can. Well, then afterwards, I learned to set up before I go in, here's a pre-presentation checklist. This is everything I need to know. And what I didn't know that I learned was they had just found out after, I think it was three months of being on this base and never being off of it. Those that made it were told last night, they had no desire to learn anymore. Oh, okay. And so that's on me, that's not on them. Mm -hmm. I did not investigate enough my audience before I got in front of them. Hmm. Well, that's also very, very interesting. Uh, I, I try to, when I go to conferences, when I speak at conferences, I always listen to the people ahead of me, you know, because you can connect in that way. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> I remember another, uh, you know, one of the lectures that you did here, you sit in the audience before, yeah. and then walk on a stage and you know, you'd sort of mimic what you thought that the audience was thinking. And that's a permission thing. Yeah. Uh, I was writing a book with a, a friend and he uh, showed it. This is the comment that they made about the introduction to the book is you, you have to ask for permission first. And this was not a, a person familiar with that uh, concept, but the, that was well, the thing he picked up is you, you're not asking for permission before you're going right into the text. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, it's not often that I think about that. So now I'm reminded. That's that's a good one. Mm. In terms of in terms of books, you're my hero in terms of how prolific you are. And I remember one comment you made years ago, John. You said half of the success will be the title. And boy, I work on that all the time. I go, that's not a good title. Get another title. That's it's hard. It's very hard. Uh, mm. But it's true too. Um, and. Yeah. Um, it still is. Well, I, I keep going on. I can't help myself. But uh, sometimes the, the titles are a struggle. John, if I could, let me just um, offer to your audience, how do you know if you have permission? And so it's easy to say one on one. And then when you go to a group, it's a little harder. Hmm. But it basically is a, do we have the word teeter totter? Yes, yes, there is. Yeah, uh, In German, seesaw. Mm -hmm. Seesaw. So on the seesaw, if the audience is breathing very, very low, you have very, very high permission. Mm -hmm. And if the audience is very breathing very high, you have low permission. Mm -hmm. So it's a seesaw. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're with the individual, you can determine that a lot better. When you're with a group, it, the difference is, are they still or are they stiff? Mm -hmm. And boy, that difference is so subtle. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I could talk to you forever. <laughs> it's just, it's just the nuances of things. It's just so interesting. It's just fascinating because, you know, originally I'm not talking about myself, but, you know, originally I'm not, I'm not a micro person. I'm a macro person. Yep. You know, did yep. my original work in values, in values yep. clarification. So, uh, you know, all the, the micro aspect of things, the small behaviors is, uh, you know, I've gotten that from you and I'm forever grateful uh for that um, the, um John, one, one of the ways we can look at our how we intersect <clears throat> with each other is you can look at three levels of perception mm. uh you can start with the meta with your philosophy what's right. your big purpose and then you can go to strategies called the mm. the macro and then you go down to the actual application which is the micro mm. or you can go the other way you can start at the bottom and go up so two ways that change people, one is from inside out and from the outside mm -hmm. in. Right. And so that's, that's where we intersect well with each other.
Mm -hmm. Well, no, no, absolutely. I'm uh, very appreciative, again, of all the things that I've learned from you. Um, I'm, I'm going to look at my notes here. And um, um, I, OK, that was the key question I was going to ask about uh, the you know, uncertainty and a challenge and, and uh, meeting that challenge. The, the hardest group for me to get permission from is doctors. I have to find them. Mm. That's all. But you'd think that the police and the military here was an interesting comment because I think here they do get training in the nonverbal. They're uh, they're pretty good about it here. I mean, they they understand that this is important. And actually, yeah. the the military leadership training has a really good reputation here. Yeah, yeah. It, um, it's there's no question mm. I had full permission in terms of power, mm. but I had no permission in terms of. Um, growth mindset versus fixed mindset. Okay. What's what's a challenge that you have coming up? Uh, mine, mine is how do I take everything I know about the third level, which is perception, mm. and put it online? So I've set aside $100,000 to do that. And I've asked a very capable person, her name happens to be Amy, and she's my office manager, mm. if she would be in charge of that. Not necessarily doing the grunt work. But okay. the, the thing that goes in my mind is, what are the organizing principles of perception? Where do you start? So how do I know what I know? And if I go intuition, then I'm still back on just the meta level and I'll never teach them how to do what I can do. Hmm. So I've got to try to tie all three of these levels together. Okay. And one of the things we're coming up with is, if you have, um, data that you get from another person or a group mm. and you have no interpretation, it's useless. But if you have an interpretation without evidence, you're dangerous. So it's that mm. fine line. Mm. How do you support what you're saying instead of just trying to self-validate uh, what you already believe before you've started? Would you be doing uh, film, filming or animations or... Well, we, are, we already have some on YouTube and what we've done as a policy for the last five years, everything I do, I put up on YouTube. Then when I get ready to do a course, I pull them back down. So you mm. can't get to it unless you sign up for the course. So okay. it, we have lots of stuff. Uh, if you want, uh, one of them besides the house of communication would be uh, chairs of, sorry, circles of humanness mm. and then circles and chairs of negotiation. And that's the course I start this Saturday. It's on couples communication. And we'll do four Saturdays uh, in March, but it's taped as well as live so that someone can sign up to take it and sure. take it at any time you want. Uh, well, that's good. Okay. Well, you sure thought about these things. Uh, a lot of, <laughs> okay. Um, we're gonna uh, you know, round off now. And uh, you know, I appreciate the time that you've given me. And uh, I know all the, uh, I understand a lot of preparation goes into what you do and a lot of details and that's to be appreciated. And you know how much I've appreciated you through the years. Um, what, what uh, do you have anything you want to ask me? <laughs> I don't know if you, you may be curious about if we're having a, you know, a dialogue. Uh, John, John, if you could gather whatever group in front of you that you wanted, hmm. what would be that group and what would be your message? Gosh, I'd still work with my, my favorite group is still teachers and uh, you know that like in their thirties and forties and, and finding out that this profession is much more difficult than they had, they had planned for and uh, helping them to look inside themselves. I, I mean, I've always been interested in the people doing the actual jobs rather right. than the principals or, yeah, or, yeah. or the administrative uh, people. Um, in Sweden, things are extremely top-down run, and I, I, I would like the, the, the teachers on the floor doing the work to feel more uh, power um, and to uh, work on their own, um, you know, their, their own successes or their own progress. Yeah. So um, I, that's still, that's where my heart is. And I'll yeah. continue on as long as yeah. people want me. <laughs> Second question, if I could. Mm. Where do you get your ideas and how do you know you have an idea? Oh. 
Well, that's a hard one. I, I'm very intuitive. I mean, I, I write the, the, the things that I write, uh, I've never done myself, you know, right. because I haven't been a teacher. I mean, I have a teacher's degree, but I never really used it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I seem to know what works and what doesn't work. You know, so that that's something that's oh, contributed to my ability. And mm -hmm. then I, I've had Osa as a partner for, for many years now, and she's been working with the, the last few years with some of the most difficult kids at the junior high level. Yeah. And uh, she comes home with her stories about uh, how the city schools work <laughs> or don't work and uh, about her meetings with some of these uh, the kids that have had very, very difficult lives. Yeah. Uh, and the way she uh, describes her way of, of meeting them, greeting them, and the, the, this caring of uh, this, uh, a politeness, general. I mean, I'm yeah. like the value of another, her, her behavior. Uh, I'm more, that, that's your thing. That's more, that's just, she's just so completely polite and yeah. welcoming and warm. That yeah. all that you know, talking about permission, all the sort of yeah. aggression just sort of disappears. I say, okay, this is a person I can work with. Yeah. And then, yeah. then they start to relax, and then the work can begin. I, I would they, guess. I would guess she just peels off the layer of defensiveness, right. and at some point they go, "I'm safe." That that's exactly what's happening. I'm safe, and then once they're safe then they have the free attention because they don't have to be on guard. Mm. And with that free attention, they can learn. I've learned a lot from her, but she, she knows how to make people feel safe. And she yeah. knows that that's her job. Yeah. Uh, because that's, that you have to have that, otherwise you're not gonna get anywhere, especially with kids that have felt unsafe around adults for all their lives. Yeah. I mean, she, she's basically worked with, worked with kids that have walked on foot from Afghanistan to, to Sweden. You know, mm -hmm. The whole world has uh, abandoned them. Yeah. And um, how do you get their permission? Well, well you just make them safe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Michael, I'm gonna round off here. I, I'm so appreciative of your time and expertise and, and keeping up our contact with each other. And I'd like to thank you very, very much. I'm going to stop recording now and we'll have a, a little chat afterwards.